so sorry. How do you say your first name again? Uh, Matias. I mean, Matias. Matias. Spelled yes. with a T H. Yes. All right. I'm here with Matias Semek, and he is an old instructor of mine, and he has an expertise in film, film history, film theory. So I came back to his class to kind of talk to you a little bit about film and see what's see what's up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we were talking a little bit before we were recording about um, the students and how you were interested in what they picked up on and what they kind of leave behind. And I remembered I was telling you that this was one of the first times um, taking this class, film as literature, was one of the first times that I had. We were watching movies from certain decades and showing how they represented that decade. And uh, you said The Breakfast Club was still one that you show and still a good one to go back to for that. Um, and I was just wondering if you had uh, a little bit more to say about that, or um, about the Breakfast Club, or about the either. Uh, well, the let me go back a little bit. The, the class is like is interesting because it's the first time that high school students can actually take a class that. Mm -hmm. Could you lean a little forward? Yeah, with it, with a with the students get full credit for an English class. Um, but they get to watch films or focus on films for as as their object of analysis. So you do pretty much everything that you've done with books or literature before, but now you switch your focus to films, which is a really new thing for for students because they, you know, like I said earlier, like they're for a lot of students, this class is a real switch from actually looking at films as something that can teach you or show you something about life, about society, about culture, the world you live in. Uh, and it's not just something that you just use for entertainment's sake. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's usually what students come bring with them when they come to my class. Like this whole, you know, the concept is such a novel concept for them that they actually, you know, looking at films, um, that, that there's more meaning to it. A, a film like Breakfast Club, of course, is has meaning because they they connect with the content, with the characters. And because mm -hmm. it's about high school, it's about growing up and the problems of growing up and identity and, and all those kind of things. So that makes it kind of obvious. But you have, you can even make these kind of connections with films where it's not as obvious, like superhero films, for instance, you know, that maybe seem to be very remote from everyday real life. But even those films have a, there's, there's, there's always something in these films that connects somehow with real life or what we like about the film. Yeah. Yeah. God, the rise in superheroes. That was actually. I actually, as I was leaving this class was when the 3D movies started coming out. And at the time, it was like Twilight and then Alice in Wonderland 3D. And the superheroes, like Iron Man had just come out like two years before or something. So they had just started to make it big. They weren't as crazy as they are now. Or now the Avengers movies, they're all coming together. But um, I was just watching this thing where they were talking about how it's crazy that these big, uh, that the big corporations right now, they own more more so than they like own actors and movie after movie, but they own these characters that mm -hmm. are worth so much more. So the Batman, I think, is getting rebooted now in 2020 or 2021. I think I have that. I may have that wrong. But just the fact that whoever has Batman now has that character and that they'll keep using it um, over time. Uh, it's just really crazy. But that had just started when I left this class. Um, do you like the superhero movies? Um, I do and I don't. I just think like they're, they're part part of the superhero um, uh, is like like you pointed out, there's a big corporation element to it. There's a big money machine behind it mm -hmm. um, where I kind of like, you know, approach those kind of films with caution where I think there is a, you know, and then again, don't get me wrong. I don't, I, I would never claim that every film is a, is a piece of art and every film is super meaningful. There's a lot of bad films. There's a lot of films where if they never were made, then, you know, we we wouldn't miss them, right? So uh, in superhero films is, is is a little bit of a in some ways they are they are mass production they are uh, you know billion dollar productions they are about making money uh, they are what sells right now mm -hmm. um, at the same time some sometimes they for me it's always interesting what what people or directors for instance smuggle into these films like whether sometimes they you know whether it's environmental issues or yeah. global warming or whatever it is. Sometimes they they somehow bring that in there too. Yeah. Or, and even if that if that's not the case, it's also I think young people like that because um, superhero films are ultimately heroes' journeys. They're ultimately films about somebody struggling or you know good versus evil or some kind of a moral battle is at stake. You know so. There again is the, the that that element that where people connect to you know that that what that 
even though it's very abstract because it's superheroes, you know, they don't really exist. It's a fiction, highly fictionalized story. Mm-hmm. But um, the, the, the emotions are real. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why people like them. Yeah, they're the epics. Yeah. They gather everyone where others yeah. are a little more, yeah. I don't know, specific to whatever you like. I saw you had um, the Blair Witch Project poster up there. Yeah. And I love the found footage genre. Even, even when they're not that good or they're a little corny. I still always love it. It brings me to like, I feel like it's actually happening a lot of the time, even when they're overdone. And that was so cool because not only was it the first one, but it's still the one to this day that, I don't know, doesn't, it doesn't have to be structured exactly like other films or like do the whole explosive ending or like, and they never really, they never showed the monster as I like to say it. And it just played on fear the whole time. And I was wondering, do you like the Blair Witch Project a lot? Is that why it's up there? Yeah, no, it's actually um, I got that poster from a friend, and and and, and, and um, what I like about the film is just an example of, of one of those films where you you have um, filmmakers who had very little at their disposal. Mm-hmm. You know, no, they did not have the superhero million dollar budget, right? So they had just you know whatever they had, and 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 somehow, but um, they made the most out of it, and 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 they knew how to effectively use the camera, and they had a gripping story, and and so. So I use that actually as an example for in my class um, because at the beginning of the term, I guide the students through the history of film. So we go from silent films, sound films, then comes later on comes the uh, cinema scope, then comes uh, the the switch from mm-hmm. from from then comes the switch from um, analog to um, digital. Uh, and in the end, yeah, you know, like a film like Blair Witch Project is done with so few little means. And accomplished so much, and so I, I use it as an example to t- point out to students that in the end it doesn't really matter what you have. What matters is, do you have a do you have spirit? Do you have a do you have a vision? Do you have a do you have a concept? Do you you know do you have enthusiasm? You know that's what's gonna make your project, and you start with whatever humble um, things you have to begin with. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, my sister and I are trying to write a movie right now. <laughs> um, learned a lot in film school, and it was very hands-on film school. But yeah, we really want to get it done and uh, made with very little resources. I don't want to do found footage genre, um, but I still there's something about it. Even um, oh, actually, it was that year, the last year I had this class, Paranormal Activity came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another and, good example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that um, if I have my research correct, ten thousand dollar budget. And they sold yeah, they, I think they, they they mortgaged their home or something. I read somewhere and and you know filmed it at their own place. That's so cool. And then the rest is history, as they say. You know, then they, I think they sold out the franchise. But you know, I'm, I'm sure they you know were laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, <laughs> paid out for them. You know, but oh, even absolutely. them, they had to have. I, I'm sure they didn't to begin with. They didn't necessarily do because of the money. I'm pretty sure they also did it because they were enthusiasts. You know, they were yeah. into. They wanted to make a, a film, and they were really into it. And they were there, you know. They had that kind of passion, you know. I don't think anyone makes those kind of films or takes on that much money just for the money. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I'm sure everybody's. It's it's great when eventually art pays for for itself. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the dream of everybody who's in the in that artistic movement. Like my brother is a child himself as a filmmaker and, and a director in, in Berlin, and and you know that can be it's a it can be frustrating and and you know for every Scorsese. To, that makes it there's a 10,000 who didn't make it it's just how it is but that goes with many other artistic um, careers and paths absolutely your brother um, tried some directing in Berlin is he still doing that no, he switched it. Like I think he realized he had a couple of films, short films that he made. He was even at some festivals, and and uh, but then it just That's didn't cool. it just didn't move forward anymore. And then I think he realized at some point it's just I don't know. If, my brother's you know he just switched the focus. He then turned to gaming, mm-hmm. and um, applied. He's more of a storyteller, so his th- take was then like, okay, how can I develop a game? B- but think of a good cool story that is intricate to people so people want to get them to play this game because it's a cool story that if you get involved in it oh, something like cool. that so he's on game development now some like that yeah but my brother is always like in these kind of you know berlin is kind of like the just like san francisco is like the mecca of everybody in germany who w- wants to be creative or or you know is into the pop culture or arts etc i didn't know that berlin yeah interesting definitely help for that yeah um, when did when did you find interest in film? Did you go to school for it? Or? No, my take is a, my story is a completely different one. Um, I I was in when I did my student teaching thing. Um, I 
that was a time when we talk in like in the classrooms the, you had chalkboards mm -hmm. that was it you know what i mean <laughs> like there was like maybe maybe an overhead projector or something like that so um you wanted to show and i always liked i always liked using film because i know that's that's a great way to get kids attention mm -hmm. cuz kids love watching films mm -hmm. so that's a great hook and to get them interested in something and so i was teaching philosophy religion in germany and and you had to like rent get it from the from the janitor you had to get these big TVs that were on these these stands that you had to roll them from one classroom to another because there was only one for the whole school so you had to like bring that to your classroom and set it up with a uh, you know with the VHS tape you know you remember those like the mm -hmm. real like so you had to um so it's very tedious but that's where it started that's why I got interested I wrote my master thesis on how to um use media in a in a in a language arts setting oh that's cool when Seal Canyon this high school started Uh, when we opened, we started to open up elective for seniors. Then I tapped my then um, principal and said, "Hey, I have a you know educational background in in film, and I know that film is lit as an is a, is an option for senior elective. So we can can we offer that?" And you know, she looked at what I had and heard me out, and and you know, we gave it a shot, and the rest is history, so to speak. Been doing um, it now for eighteen years, no, sixteen years. Okay, yeah, that's really cool. I love the class. I think it's great for high school kids too. We all had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, it's also very overlooked. Like there, it's a, it's a, you know, it's it's funny how the American educational system is, especially for humanities and language arts, very stuck in looking at literature as the only way of for somehow that matters. Like this is, you know, like you 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 read for ages on years on um, books, essays. You write essays hardly ever does education bother to look at the reality of life, which is that most students perceive the world through visual images. And so my take is also to teach, you know, in, in addition to the to literacy, at, uh, but also to advance their, their visual uh, literacy, their media literacy, because that's the world they really live in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not we're not living in a world where people are talking about the latest books that appear. That was how it was 100 years ago, 50 years ago. That's when books literature was still mm -hmm. like, that was the medium. This is how people would, um, you know, distribute uh, new ideas and concepts or whatever it is. But that has changed. The medium has changed. You know, kids do not read newspaper. And, you know, students hang on their vices and they, you know, they watch all kinds of things. They're surrounded by visual media. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if... Again, my, for me, education is always important that you somehow need to address that, that you are, you know, if you if you claim that you prepare students for the real world, you need to also then make bring that reality into your classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's even, I remember even when signing up for the class, there was the stigma of, oh, so what are you just going to do all day? Just watch movies? Like there was yeah, it has like, that oh, that's so, Yeah, that's it has that law. stigma. Like the, the, you know, I always had that uphill battle for my class because <laughs> it is always like, you know, the, the, what you do in class, oh, Mr. So-and-so showed us a film. And so it has always that stigma of the, the lazy teacher shows the film. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, saying? Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, you have to, A, at this school, but I, mean, I think in, in all schools, like so you kind of like have to fight that battle. Uh, but uh, realistically, I, m students in my class, we watch one film per week. For two weeks, I'd say on average, it's like two weeks per one film. Um, and they don't necessarily like every film they have to watch. Um, and then if you think about it, that's the same amount of time, if not more, that they would spend on, you know, it takes my students, for instance, ninth graders, it'll take them four, three weeks to read To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. just reading a book. So how is it any different reading a book in class as a class together versus you watch a film together? I don't, I, I don't see the a big difference between yeah, those two yeah. necessarily. Yeah, I'm totally with you, and especially especially with us, the new generation that's grown up. Yeah. Um, my sister and I talk about that, how much of our, I guess, uh, not morals, but um, yeah, I guess somewhat morals uh, we get from like uh, our favorite television shows and favorite stories that we've seen visually, but for some reason TV and movies have this uh, stigma of just being like a waste of time or being the thing to do to blow off time. Yeah, it's uh, just entertainment, easy. right? And there's yeah, nothing yeah. to entertain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I obviously just went nuts with it and went to film school with it because I, I loved it so much. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm hoping to be able to write my own thing someday and make something. It'd be fun. <laughs> um, back a little bit on the uh, Blair Witch Project, though. Um, do you know any movies that weren't 
found footage that were of like um, any that come off the top of your head that weren't the found footage genre that were sort of like that low in resources that were that impactful or at least that meaningful to you if they weren't that impactful to um, everyone else? There's another film called "There's a uh, the Bicycle Thief." Yeah, it's, it's a you know the Italian. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, you know sometimes the 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 early films were also films where you if you look at them they were like done on with very little means simply because they didn't have them. Mm -hmm. um, so those are other examples that I'm that I'm aware of. Um, uh, other than that, I I don't know. I think there's a lot of short films probably out there. Um, a lot of shorts, yeah. Yeah, where I think, because to me, often people who make short films are people who, you know, are yet trying to get their foot in the door, you know, and, mm -hmm. and short film is a, because of the time, you often don't need a whole lot, you know, and, and so they're often done on a, on a lower budget for that matter. Yeah, it's interesting going back and watch, like we would watch a lot of famous shorts in film school and how many of them you'll see, like they're now famous actors mm -hmm. um, that I like they had made their start just by being in a short in Sundance it's, and it had gotten a lot of praise, but you know, it's not like no one covers the, the shorts in the media, you know, yeah, no one really yeah. cares too much. So, um, but that's how like a lot of actors will get seen or other people that get um, further business in the industry. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, what are some of what are your some of your favorite movies? That's funny, like because students, of course, always want to know like what are some. Yeah. Of your I have a really mixed combo of our favorite uh, movies. You know, I um, I have movies that are very personal because I think everybody has films that are like a reflection of who you were at a certain point in your time, and, uh. and they or maybe they were motivational, or you know, and or maybe that was the time when. That was when your parents were, you were still a kid and that was happy, good times. And you always remember that film for that matter. Like the Polar Express, uh, to give an example, like the, I love to watch the Polar Express come Christmas. Oh, really? Because my, and my kids love to watch it because we all like to watch it. I think if it weren't, and maybe if it weren't for me, my kids didn't even want to watch it anymore. But it kind of like, it, it's kind of like this film that we so like ritualistically watch together. Mm -hmm. So there's those, but there's other films where, they um were inspiring, like Pulp Fiction or Train Spotting. Oh, Train Spotting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, God, that one's um, crazy. Just because of how they were made, or the soundtrack they used, or 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 any of those things, you know, like um, mm. um. Uh, there's the um, you know, the Mel Gibson, the um, ap Apocalyptica. Oh, Apocalypto. Apo yes, Apocalypto. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought no. that was. Actually, that I actually thought that was an amazing film. I, I totally agree. I yeah. love Apocalypse. Yeah. And I think that was a. Uh, I think there was. A, I think the reason why I didn't get all the attention that it deserved is because Mel Gibson shot himself right in the foot. There was that was just. I think the film got released either before, or just after he had that incident. Remember, oh, he got, is that why he got pulled over? He was drunk, and then he like was like you know slurring some anti-Semitic uh, things and. That made all the headlines, you know. So he yeah. has like he had all the negative I didn't know attention. That makes so much more sense. I thought people just didn't like the movie. I didn't know they happened at the same I time. I think just people that because he got all the negative, he was suddenly a negative headliner. You know, uh, he, people just suddenly didn't, you know, it didn't yeah. get the attention that the yeah. film otherwise should have gotten. You know. Yeah, because God, I, I, I was, yeah, I was shown that in like 2009. I finally saw it, and I loved it. It was an intense um, film. Such a yeah, fun was, ride. Yeah, yeah, it was a in in the the love, you know. He made the Passion of the Christ before that, and I always, little, I'm always a little iffy about those kind of films because <laughs> I'm not necessarily very religious. And so, um, when people attempt to, you know, tell some kind of a Jesus film, I'm always going like, okay, you know, because mm -hmm. um, you know, then I'll go like, what are you trying to sell? But I always know, even with the Passion of the Christ, you always know, you already notice this attempt by um, Gibson to kind of like the attention to detail, the fact that he had people talk in the the original language. Yeah, uh, whether it's in Apocalypto or in in, in um, uh, the Passion of the Christ, so that's pretty impressive that somebody's trying to really actually go the length and and try to make it as historically accurate as possible. Yeah, um, I heard Apocalypto had some historical inaccuracies about. Um, well, I'm sure. So so that's the Passion of the Christ. I'm oh, sure yeah, you yeah. can't do it, but, but at least attempt the 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 kind of totally. like to 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 try that. You know, like where if you go back in Hollywood or whatnot, like you know, I'm sure there was a time when they could have cared less about those kind of things, and where like mm -hmm. you had like, you know, Caesar looked like Elvis, or you know, what I mean, like they're just it was just uh, more or less yeah. of a joke. You know, what I mean, like where they like <laughs> yeah. they 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 dress in their, in their in their gowns, but they're like you know, <laughs> then they they talk with a British accent, and their hairstyle was like you know how it was in the 50s or 60s. So. Yeah. 
that oh, kind that's of stuff. Funny. Yeah, but I I love the apocalypto. I love movies that are very um they're very linear and they they're almost like events played out. Um, the more you jump around, the more non-linear, and especially if you throw some narration in there, you start to just lose me. Unless they're really, really good, um, I, I really like them to play out. That's why, uh, like, it kind of reminds me of Mad Max: Fury Road, the mm-hmm. newest reboot of it, because I loved that movie. And everything on paper, like the idea of it, isn't something I would normally really care too much about. Um, but the, how how good the production was, and how it was sort of just like a nonstop thrill ride, and talk about raising the stakes. And Apocalypto, if you want to learn about raising stakes at every moment it just i couldn't believe that movie but yeah i had a lot of fun with it, it yeah because i think like um at the beginning of the um term i i have people students have like put, have them put together their 10 favorite films and i try to encourage them to pick films for different reasons because i think like you said like there's some films that are just like crafted superbly you know we just mm-hmm. see like there's not a like um there's not a boring minute in there it's just like from mm-hmm. beginning to end it's just the ride yeah. Or um, films are motivational or, or they're sentimental or emotional, you know, or for comedy for me, it's like Big Lebowski is an example where I go like there's everything from how they 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 just happen to cast the right people for the right roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's not a I can't think of any there's not a single dull moment in there. You know, it's more like <laughs> every line is almost a cracker in there. You know, it's just uh, it's funny. just a, it's just a well done comedy. But then I think, uh, you know, also I think they were just also fortunate again, maybe the fact that they happened to cast the right people that you know the chemistry was also right. Right. For that film. And then the script was good. It was a good dialogue. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a good comedy for me. Yeah. Yeah, when when films become that uh, perfect storm that you look beforehand, you're like, how could they have seen all this working so well? Yeah. And then it does. I watched someone, I think it was a YouTuber who, who analyzed Pirates of the Caribbean and talked about how it was set up to just be another bad, like huge Disney blockbuster and how everything worked out the way it was. And I mean, it was based off the ride, mm-hmm. you know? It just seems like you do everything wrong to set up for it. And the, the idea of the story itself is kind of corny and... Uh, but the way everything came together ended up being just a spectacular movie. I love the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, at least the first one. And that was uh, when I think of like the perfect when movies come together as like a perfect storm of like it worked somehow. Yeah, I think of Pirates. <laughs> and and you and also you don't sometimes it's funny like for if you think of Shawshank Redemption, mm-hmm. or you think of um, Big Lebowski is another good example in the sense that these are films like where they actually they weren't necessarily well received by the critics. They didn't. Oh, yeah. nec- they didn't necessarily, you know, bring in the money that the industry may have expected. Yeah. But they had a later on after their once they were released as DVDs and online and whatnot. Suddenly they like gathered a fellowship and they suddenly they kind of like uh, little by little grew to that cult status where suddenly mm-hmm. people really everybody now Shawshank Redemption is like at least in the list that I've seen is always like one of the top ten be- most beloved films of the American people. You know, yeah. so it's funny how that also like. You know, it, initially it wasn't really what people maybe thought it was, or you know, didn't get a lot of attention. But give it, a, you gave it a couple of years, and suddenly, wow, yeah, it's still you know now on corporate TV. I think Shawshank Redemption is always on on some TV <laughs> show. That's funny because yeah, growing up, I just always heard of it as like a classic. Mm-hmm. Everyone talked about the Shawshank Redemption. I didn't know it was kind of a flop mm-hmm. when it came out. Well, I wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't call it a flop, but it wasn't, for instance, it wasn't really a an Oscar runner, or it wasn't. Oh, um, that's weird. I think it did moderate as in terms of money. Yeah, uh, and the, you know, the I think it was well perceived by the critics, but it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like, for instance, like like we just talked about earlier about Amadeus, you know, which which was like the 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 film of the year. I think Amadeus got eleven Oscars. It was one of those years oh where you that. had one film that just dominated every category, <laughs> and so you know, Shawshank Redemption was not. So, uh, but it it later proved itself in, you know, in the following years. Mm-hmm. Did Amadeus really win eleven? Yeah, it was very up there. It was like one That's of the first crazy. ones. Like, oh, like a new record. And, you yeah, because re- the third Lord of the Rings got the final record. I think they still have it. It's thirteen, yeah. I believe. Yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, I didn't know Amadeus got that many. But it is a really good movie. I love Amadeus. Um, but yeah, and when I hear uh, stories of the Big Lebowski, it's mm-hmm. the same. I think even. If I remember correctly, it was Mark Mannon talking about it on his podcast where he talked about when they all went to go see it together. I think it was him and Chris Rock and some other and like nobody liked it, even them. Mm-hmm. And they now all talk about it as a classic and how funny it is. But even when it came out, uh, the, like Cohen brothers and the whole cast, they were expecting it to be good. And then they just everyone was kind of booing during it. Yeah, and not yeah, enjoying yeah, yeah, yeah. It. But uh, it's, it's weird how that can happen with certain films, that little cult following. Yeah. 
I had that with Napoleon Dynamite. The first time I, I saw Napoleon <laughs> really? Dynamite, I thought, <laughs> what this is so stupid um i had a, a second take uh watched it then i I started like it and now i have the dvd and i watch it with my kids <laughs> that's so funny yeah yeah we grew up watching it we love the one-liners um but then i watched it again after years of putting it down i hadn't seen it mm -hmm. forever i watched it again as an adult and i really like it i just think it's a great little yeah. as far as like an indie film goes um for just being like having so much character i i think it's such a good one i think the music like the really crappy keyboard music is so good <laughs> i think it carries it really well um but yeah that movie had a lot of good things in it i like that one a lot um i had a question and now i forget um oh we were talking about apocalypto um some of your favorite movies that's weird that you mentioned that on one of your favorite movies because i always i always think of it mm -hmm. and well i always forget it and then remember it and i sometimes think like god is that like one of my top five because i love it um, but I never hear anyone talk about it. Um, yeah. That's one of the movies that just kind of under the radar, and everyone's like, "Eh, historically inaccurate." Mel Gibson. Uh, yeah, 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 no. yeah, yeah. But no, that was a really good ride. Um, do you like movies that are a little more like that, like sequential thrill ride, or a little more historical, or whatever it is? Yeah, I, I like. Um, I get. I I do like films where I feel like they take me back into history. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's like Amadeus, you really do feel like oh, you really do feel like you're in Vienna of, of the Baroque Vienna in that world, or Apocalypto, you know, because of the language you, or if it's like a well done um, war film. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I do like films where like where I feel like they you know you they take you in a time machine and you just get to be back in what it was like, or at least we want to believe, right? That's what filmmaking is all about. It's all about wanting to make a belief, right? So the, the illusion is real. You're yeah. really buying into it. You like, feel like, ah, this is maybe what it was really like or, you know, so um, so I like that about films, that's for sure. Yeah. God, this period piece has cost so much because they can't just use what's around us right now um, and they have to they have to make all, the, like everything you see on the screen from costume to set production is just all, has to be handmade and authentic. Yeah. Um. Have you been? Have you watched any of the uh, the marvelous Mrs. Merritt uh, Maisel? It doesn't ring a bell. I'm sorry. No, it's like it's that it's the new um. Is it show not Showtime? Shoot, I'm gonna. Oh, Amazon. It's the new uh Amazon series that I think it won a couple awards last year. But it's about the stand-up comedian. Yeah. It's a woman becoming a stand-up comedian in the 50s or 60s. I think 50s. And just the way they do the music and the sets and everything, it's really good. Um. But that's. That's a it's a series. It's not a it's not a movie, but um, the period and the time, the way they do it, is just so cool. I love the shots. Well, that's an interesting topic. Also, what you mentioned there about the um, how how the internet and digital filmmaking has really broken up the audience. You know, what I mean, like you just said, like there's there's now there's Amazon, there's Hulu, there's Netflix. They now have their own productions. Um, the what was the um, the Birdcage, you know, on Netflix. Was that the Sandra Bullock one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't, I only, you know, watched it so like on the side. It wasn't really, I don't even think I finished it entirely, but I just remember it being a big, you know, you can only watch it on Netflix. And so then in other words, what I'm saying is like, you know, even on, I'm sure there's even things you can only watch on YouTube. And mm -hmm. so the, there's so much more back in the days, like if you go back where 70s or whatnot, there was really just, certain films got so much attention because the, it was such a limited medium. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so many things published or shown and, you know, I had to, if you, I, I told the kids, like, you know, if you talk to your parents, movie going in the 70s or 80s, 60s, you wanted to see it for certain films, you had to go to the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't see it in the movie theater, you locked out. You didn't get to see it. You can. You weren't part of the discussion. <laughs> so you had to go, and movies would play for for that much longer. Like right. Star Wars. Star Wars were so popular; would be in the movies for months. You know, like because everyone wanted to see it, so you had to see it. And then blockbuster, the video, the home video, changed that to begin with. Uh -huh. And now it's broken up even more with with internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like there's, you can't even catch up anymore. It's like you know, like um, for better or worse, you know, like um. There's more variety now. There's more opportunities for for young filmmakers to to publish, but there's a, the audience is also more selective now, and it has shrunk. You know, like uh, you don't have that million um, audience anymore necessarily. You know, if you do, yeah. then that's a really good film that speaks for the film. If you have, if in this day and age, if if somebody makes a film that is so essential, so important that really 
you have a whole society talking about it, then that's in this day and age that that, that will be a real accomplishment. Oh, that's uh, because funny. that's bec that's the, because those kind of things I think becoming a rarity now because now it's more isolated. You have, you know, you mentioned Showtime, but you know everybody has Showtime. You have to pay for that, right? So uh, that only is relevant to people who pay and watch Showtime or right. HBO, same thing, or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, God, that it was so crazy. I I really. It brought to my it brought that to my attention when the Coen Brothers released their film on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I think it was just a few months ago. Yes, the Ballad of Buster Shrugs. Yeah, and I have right. yet to see that. Yeah, but it was it was crazy that I just opened up a new tab on my computer mm -hmm. and I had it on my other monitor, and the front page was just watch the Coen Brothers new film, and I was yep. like. That should be something I'm waiting months for and like talking yeah. like we're all talking about yeah, yeah. oh the Coen brothers have a new movie coming out. We're going to see it when it comes out. Yeah. And instead it was just like what's new on my feed? What yeah. is the new Coen Brothers movie? I could not believe it. Yeah, and if you're busy like me grading papers and you kinda like disappear in your own world of, of school, it's sometimes it's hard to catch up anymore. You know, like you have to mm -hmm. um Yeah, I have to, you have to totally kinda like, you know, you're you have to make an effort to go out every once in a while. But actually to be honest, like that's why I have to make myself go out to the movies and Mm -hmm. Every time I do, I appreciate it because it's still a different experience and kind of like connects you again with what is, if there is still such thing, but what is still the mainstream, what is still coming down the pipeline in terms of these are mm -hmm. the, the films that matter every year. Yeah, God, I would I, it would be heartbreaking to see theaters start leaving at a rapid rate because going to the movies, the smell, the the way we treat it, you know, the ritual is just so, yeah, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. it so much that yeah, yeah. I, I'm one of the few people I don't know, if not the only person I know, that goes to the movies alone <laughs> just because I like going, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I do this, so I want to keep up with movies a little more, and it's just hard to find people that are willing to go to a movie all the time. Um, but yeah, that was really crazy when I saw the Coen brothers come up with their movie on uh, just the new thing on Netflix. It is really good if you feel like watching it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really liked it a lot. But uh, yeah, I heard... I can't remember who I heard. It must have been in film school somewhere. Someone talking about when The Graduate came out, mm -hmm. and would they wouldn't they re-release -re movies like if they did well, and then they were out of theaters for a while, they would come back in theaters. They were always like, in, I remember in the '80s, there were always these theaters, at least in bigger cities, that would specialize in showing the reruns. And so the, now you can see older films, or from last year, or two years, or even older, and 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 that would that's what they would specialize in, and. Uh, I remember in I was in Seattle in 85, 86, there was this one theater and they would show, you know, be like Woody Allen Night or something. And then plus the those movies would be cheaper. And so it'd be like, uh -huh. you know, three, four dollars you'd be in and, you know, be something to do on a Saturday night or Friday night. You know, if you have any better plans, so you go to those movies. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, to those movie theaters. Yeah. Yeah. He was just sharing how, like, he was so excited to see The Graduate again. And I was like, because it's only going to be in theaters for this well, short now, time. Well, now, now places, you know, now, you know, there's a couple of places in in San Diego where it's now you you know like you said it's it's they show the graduate or the big Lebowski and then you know you can sit by the pool and they project it against oh, the screen yeah, and yeah. you know there's waiters with cocktail and so they like you said it kind of like I like it because I think it makes it you make an effort to go out and it's kind of like a ritual and it's a fun way to go about it and watch films again appreciate old films even if you will yeah but if you don't but if you just want to watch it on your computer you can and that's how most people yeah, get their yeah, stuff yeah. so it's you don't really I have no idea what it's like to like have to wait for it like because i grew up and it's going to come out on dvd once it's out of theaters you yeah. know like months later so you just you watch it in theaters it's fun and then you wait for the dvd and then you watch it again and again with your yeah, friends yeah, yeah. but i that was just so crazy to hear like oh once it's out of theaters like you're not seeing your favorite movie anymore because yeah, it's not yeah. in theaters um it reminds me of something i wanted to ask you about was uh i think it was my dad who was telling me about when alien came out mm -hmm. um there were like he doesn't remember seeing a trailer for Alien, and he doesn't remember seeing like what it was going to be about. And going into the movie, he just had no idea what he was going into, and that's part of the reason it was so freaking scary yeah. and so crazy. And with tra like me and my my family, we don't watch trailers at all. We close our eyes a lot of the time because I feel like for for me, it spoils the whole thing. I don't even like to know plot. I don't like to like if I know like the movement into the second act, I know the whole movie. So I. Like I, I like to just I like to keep the plot as unknown. I was wondering, what do you think about trailers? If do they bother you at all, or if no, you don't really actually, mind it? I'm a sucker for trailers. Really? Especially if I go to the uh, the, especially if I go to the independent movie, um, like the uh, in the landmark movies, mm -hmm. Kensington you know, Hillcrest. I like watching the trailers because for me, that's a way of getting a sense of what's coming and would I be interested in that. I I well, you know like like oh that looks like a interesting I I'll be I I want to watch that you know so for me I'm I I love trailers in that regard 
I like the I love the compilations. I almost like them like after the movie. I like the art of the compilations, and I like knowing genre. But for the most part, it's spo- it just gets to a point where it starts spoiling everything. And like if I'm gonna watch something, like I wish I could go in and see Alien for the first time without knowing what I'm gonna walk into. And each time I do that for a movie, like don't know anything and yeah. go in, um, it's always it makes the experience really fun not knowing anything. Was that, do trailers ever have that effect on you where like you well, kind of know what you're the only way I can relate to is that sometimes there were some trailers where you they kind of like build up a certain hype and then you went to see it and you were like um wasn't like that um, oh, especially yeah. with comedies you know those kind of trailers where you watch the you really realize the real funny the best jokes were pretty much in the trailer uh-huh. you know what I mean like yeah. that was about the you know this that, that was really those were really the funniest moment, moments of the film yeah. and they put them all in the trailer and now you went there to see the comedy, and you you thought it's just a fireworks of more, and it wasn't. And and so, <laughs> that's when uh, you know that's when how a trailer sometimes can for me like build up a certain expectation or hype, and then you go and you go like, really? And that's that was it. And, you know, um, can't think of any specific movie right now, but but I've had that with a couple of comedies where you thought, oh, it's gonna be like that, and because yeah. you watched the trailer and you thought like, oh, it's gonna be you know. Um, you know, if you like Jim Carrey, for instance, you watch Dumb and Dumber and then you watch, you see the trailer for the next Dumb and Dumber and then you get to see the next Dumb and Dumber and you go like, oh, that wasn't, it just didn't quite live up to your expectation anymore mm-hmm. in terms of what the the trailer built up. Yeah, I think, uh, I think The Hangover was when I really saw that because I wasn't even like that crazy about The Hangover, but I had also seen each plot point yeah. basically. Like I knew the tiger was in the back of the car and it woke up or i knew the tiger was there in the first place the baby like i knew each one of their funny things was waking up and like what did we do last night yeah. and like revealed a lot of it in the trailer so that's just me and my family getting we get so bitter about it because we hate knowing but i hear stories like that back from like the 70s or 80s we're like we didn't know what we were going to see we just went to go see yeah. something even star that, wars like people f- film enthusiasts I love to have those discussions about you know when the trailer is actually better than the original Oh, that's like, funny. for instance, people talk about that when with Alien and Aliens, you know, where they say, oh, the second Aliens, that was even better than the first or um, the God, Godfather trilogy, you know, where mm-hmm. a lot of people say, well, the second part is really the one that you got to. Yeah, that's yeah. the one to watch. You know, the first one is just really just a, a you know, set in the stage or whatever, you know. So, uh, yeah, but more often than not, it's, you know, like the hangover, you know, then it worked the first time let's do it another time and you know just change out the setting now it's taking place in bangkok and and you know we <laughs> yeah you know for i i'm sure for a filmmaker if you want to be successful you have to think though like how do we in a way you know there's a unit in my class we teach genre same thing you have to learn about look at your genre and, and you know genre films like westerns or comedy is always this temptation well it worked the first time let's do it again but then you know the audience kind of like kind of like wants to see it again but they mm-hmm. also kind of like want to see something new you got to give us a new kick you got to you know uh same thing with the with the with the coming back to what we started at the beginning the superheroes you know like you can see it already where because i'm always like thinking where at what point does the audience get saturated with superhero films yeah how many more superhero films can you dish out before people get in there you know what been there done that and to me you can start to see that in films where the the genre already is not taking itself so serious anymore. You have that a little bit with with that pool. There's another movie just coming out right now. I forgot the title, but where you start to see how the they're kind of like it's still a superhero film, but they're kind of like making fun of the genre in itself. They kind of like have this self consciousness, oh, yeah. you know, of of the where they're kind of like you know that pool is talking to the camera, like you know, not even pretending that hey, it's just uh, you know, yeah, um, we all know what this is all about and et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> or you know. And, changing it up and you know, Hancock is one of the first ones who did that like changed the the formula of superheroes but again like you know there's always this some at some point the genre exhausts itself and then it's like you it, it kind of like it's done every t- possible twist there is and yeah and now what do you do and then you know I'm sure at some point I, I, I predict that at some point superheroes will fade away they'll never go entire way entirely you know it just comes back at some point I think but um, there might be the audience might have been been enough for a while. Maybe you need to get a rest and now focus on some other films again. And that's the beauty of films, I think, that how genres come and go, and certain films are popular, and then they take a step back again, and suddenly other films are more in vogue and more popular again. And then that's always interesting why that is. And uh, for me, as a as a you know film academic, if you will, to me that's always interesting. Of a of what that says about us as a society of why that is that tastes change, mm-hmm. 
um, and also um, or also just for for you know from a filmmaking point of view in terms of certain things are just getting old mm-hmm. been there done it yeah let's 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 try out you know let's let's branch out and do something new yeah i i wonder where superhero movies are going i mean i i've they, they've worn me out a little bit like i'm on my third spider-man mm-hmm. like i i just like when i saw the second reboot i was like i just saw this and then they did a third one so i feel like i don't know i feel like it could just keep going so long yeah, as they're yeah. making money yeah. I, I wonder yeah as long as, as as long as i think as long the industry will probably continue making them as long as they sense that oh it's just really not selling anymore you know but as long as they it will sell yeah um but mm. i don't yeah it's just yeah and disney's not making a ton of money off these uh off their their live action remakes mm-hmm. you know i mean I think if they if they if they're making year after year, that's one of their big movies is just the remake. Like that's all that is so much income for that company, and I think they'll just continue to do it so long as it works. Um, it's kind of similar, a little bit different, but um, yeah. Does isn't that isn't that coming to the end of a genre cycle when it wears itself out like that? And I mean, once it's once it's done with the uh, once it's done with the parody, like what happens to it after that? Um, yeah. Uh, remember earlier we talked about the Scorsese film, the documentary, and there's this section where he talks about the the Western genre, and then he uses Unforgiven as an example of how the Western kind of like reinvented himself, at least at the time when Clint Eastwood made that film. And but it's kind of true, the Western was really was one one of the most popular genres in the 30s, 40s, all the way to the 50s, like with you know um, John Wayne. It was the American film. You know, it was all mm-hmm. about the Western. It was about what it meant to be American, and the American spirit, as, and so on. There's a lot about that. And then you came to the the Vietnam War, and now the audience just was tired of that old, you know, World War Two um, mm-hmm. type of film because they thought, you know, the Vietnam War is not like World War Two, and these westerns are not. We live in different times. They're not real anymore. And and you can see in the '70s after the Vietnam War, you can see how suddenly films that were more about the more realistic was suddenly popular until you had now suddenly in 1977 you had star wars coming Mm -hmm. where you had george lucas showing a film at a time when most people had no interest in those types of films because nobody had an interest in those fantasy films people wanted to see films that are about real life problems about uh, you know china syndrome about nuclear um, holocaust or whatever it is you know dealing with the real problems because that was kind of like what was fashionable at the time. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly he comes with Star Wars where people are first thinking, what? But then, you know, the rest is history again. So in, and then he opened a new door and then out came Star Wars and more Star Wars and other like Star Wars, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that escapist cinema that came after that. Um, uh, so un. It's hard to remember Unforgiven. I think I watched it in here. Yeah, and Unforgiven. But like that a, was kind of revisionist for Western. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, at least for the time, like because Clint Eastwood was, was like uh, was always like a he came from the Western and he had he owes his success to the Western and yeah. then and then he he did you know if you look at his bi- biography of not all his films were westerns but a lot of them were and but he did Unforgiven was made in the late eighties if I'm not mistaken I think it's nineteen eighty eight. So that was a time when the Western was not the most popular genre anymore. But, you know, in that Scorsese documentary, he says, like, you know, just when you think a a genre hasn't, you know, has exhausted itself, it can't go anymore. It has kind of like, you know, every story that could possibly be told has been told. You come up with something with a, you put a new slang on things and you kind of give it a new spin that people just didn't see coming or expect. And so he did that kind of with Unforgiven with the, you know, with that worn out anti-hero who's not the, you know, that those gunslingers, not all that cool. You know, it's a far cry from his spaghetti uh, Western roles that he used to play where he's oh, not all that, he's not that cool guy anymore. You know, he's not the uh, guy with the hat and the cigarette in his mouth and, mm-hmm. you know, killing is not an easy thing suddenly. So it's a new, that was for Unforgiven, a, a new take on the Western. Oh, that's but cool. I didn't know that. didn't bring necessarily back the genre, but it just, you know, the Western never went, never died out, so to speak. You know, ever so, so often you still have a Western coming out. Mm-hmm. Either remake or a hybrid, like, you know, uh, A Thousand Ways to Die in the West, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. So still there, just not as popular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that went really comedic with Seth MacFarlane doing a Western. Um but that's interesting. I didn't. Know, I didn't. I hadn't looked at Unforgiven in a long time. Uh, I'm pretty sure it won Best Picture. 
Um, mm-hmm. I had never really seen it as revisionist for the uh, for the Western genre, but that's cool. Um, yeah, so you were talking you know, a little bit before Star Wars and escapist cinema and the the big like some of the big '80s epics. The '70s was a lot more concerned on, you said, um, smaller topics or, or well, like more political things. Or yeah, I, I look at it in terms of uh, there was a generational change. Mm-hmm. You know, if you think of the late '60s, you had the, the student protests. You had the, all these. Uh, you essentially had the baby boomers coming of age. You know, the children of the the people who were like the silent generation, and now people like um, Scorsese and um, even uh, Steven Spielberg, um, George Lucas, they're all like the same generation. And so, mm-hmm. but that was a generation where like that they, you know, were critical of, of, of things. They were a generation that asked questions and then, you know, they were, you had a new film school, if you will. You had a new people who their take was to, to make things more realistic. So again, like uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, people were kind of like after Nixon's resignation, I think the nation was kind of like, in shock and then one way to deal with that shock is that you collectively you you kind of like stop dreaming and you look at more like okay let's keep it real and and mm. and, and the films reflect that you yeah. know like now the, now people are more want to watch films that are about real problems um mm-hmm. um yeah but time again moves on right so now you have a you could argue now that we have maybe now we have a generation that is um, in some ways, um, terribly apolitical and ha- doesn't, you know, maybe does not care so much about a lot of things that are happening in the world. And maybe the the avalanche of superhero films kind of documents that in a sense that you can argue that's just entertainment in some ways, you know, where there, these films are not necessarily addressing the issues full frontal. They might be hidden in there. I'm mm-hmm. not taking that away, but... These films are not, we're not made with intention, hey, we need to raise political awareness or we need to, uh, you know, make people, you know, make something that's thought provoking and make mm-hmm. people aware of, you know, whatever global scenarios or problems exist in the world today. Mm-hmm. And and that's just, that's how it is. So so you can, but, you know, but if you look back at time, there's always a constant flow of, of these things go up and down, you know? Um, yeah. Um, you can only ignore certain things for so long, and then you have a new generation who's going to ask uncomfortable questions. And that generation, once they start to make films, they're going to make films that they think represent what the world is about and what they want to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even I mean, even with the popularity of the um, the superhero movies and all that, uh, all that fantasy and the love for fairy tales. I mean, we still get like uh, Moonlight winning Best Picture. And still the still the films that focus on I guess current political issues and current uh, cultural um, dynamics. Um, so I still feel like we we still get a decent amount of that. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Like, just, but then you have to put in per, uh, put things in perspective because when you get to the awards or the Oscars, but then you have like the the film production people, the people in the business, and the people who care, kind of like amongst themselves voting for finding out what what are the best films and Mm -hmm. you know they for good reasons they pick films that are relevant or you know for instance right now roma is 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 a Mm -hmm. probably you know a foreign film but that is also highlighting a certain aspect it's a very realistic film but roma is not a film that most people watch you know what i mean like this is not like a, a mainstream there's a i think there's a difference between what mainstream people what the millions watch versus what other people watch that, but those other people are kind of like the the ones who, in the end, maybe decide who these are the the films that are, you know, educational or noteworthy or, or whatever it is, you know. But these are the mm-hmm. ones that now we nominate for the Oscars because uh, of of what they're about, because they have depth or they have meaning or whatever it is. Um, but yeah. th- but they may not always be the films that mainstream America watches. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, you're right. When a lot of them get nominated, it's like a lot of people's first time hearing about them, period. I still haven't seen Roma. I really want to because yeah. I like some of Alfonso Cuaron's yeah. work. Actually, that's probably a, one good aspect of the whole Oscars or any of those uh, these awards that they Just actually be, see... they bring in attention to films that deserve attention. So and that's that's a good thing. 
Oh, yeah, I agree. Did you see Roma yet? I have not yet. I know it's on Netflix. And, uh, oh, it is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, shoot, I was going to go to the theater. No, I, 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 saw it in the, I saw it advertised in digital cinema, and the, you know, and I was like, oh, uh, I should yeah, go I watch it. And uh, That's where I was going to go see it. Yeah. Right, and I should go watch it, and then someone said, well, you can watch it on Netflix. What's the Netflix production? I was like, really? And I'll just watch it at home then. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, so crazy. But I, have, I, haven't, I haven't watched it yet, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I want to check it out. But, um, yeah, especially black and white movies, you know, it's hard to get the... It's hard to get the public to go see that. People mm-hmm. aren't going to enjoy black and white. Roma's black and white, right? It, it might be, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure can't, it's black and white, it. yeah. But I like Alfonso Cuarón, and I'm excited to see it. Um, are there any other, one, other ones that are nominated for the Oscars this year that you're pumped or that you saw that you liked? Or? No, I don't think from what I could tell right now, there's nothing that really dominates. It's not. I don't think this is one of the years oh, where... I mean, ooh, I mean this for is, you, like, oh, that um, you really liked. Um, n- no, not at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I I need to watch more films, to be honest. I, know, um, me too. I, I don't get as out, uh, part of that a I'm busy with school, but I also have two kids. And when you have two kids, you they're not watching more films that they like, mm-hmm. I mean, like versus like what you might watch. So it's like on Friday night when it's family time or something. Then it's like okay, let's all right, fine, let's watch that. Um, yeah. But it wasn't necessarily my choice, or you know, I don't know what we watch as a family. We didn't watch The Crown, so there it is. Uh, I really I watched watch The it. Crown. Yeah, I want to see that. Uh, but there's some other films that I rather probably watch, but. You know, my wife will say, "No, that's not good for the kids. It's too whatever, too violent, or too much sex." I'm okay, can I'm not gonna watch it. Yeah. Uh, did you <laughs> see um or hear of Eighth Grade this year? Uh, I think I've seen that one. It's about middle school. It's the middle schooler girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you see it? I did watch that one with my daughter. Yeah, yeah. Did you like it? Yeah, it was an interesting film. Yeah, I yeah. loved it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was like my favorite movie yeah. in a long time. I really liked it. Um, the uh, my. So, Friends and I are uh, fans of Bo Burnham, the director, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I, had, I didn't know he was even doing that movie, but we just Googled it one day and found out he was dire- he had directed a movie, and we went to go see it, and I was like, that was the best movie I've seen in so long. I really love Coming of Age, but also I just thought that was such a such a well made story, such a good well made movie that was from uh, someone who like put effort into the actual style of it. Like I saw A Quiet Place last year. Did you see A Quiet Place? And yes, um, that's the. Um, correct me. Is that the film with um, John? Cur- with yeah. a, in the future with the aliens and yeah, they can't yeah. talk and they. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I just I thought that one fell really flat. I just didn't think it was directed in a way that I saw anything I hadn't seen before. Where eighth grade, I felt like I was seeing that a lot. Um, but the Quiet Place did really well. Everyone likes it, but I mm-hmm. was just kind of like, eh. yeah. I don't know. Did you I, like it? I did watch it, and I liked it. Yeah, and it didn't blow me away, or I was gonna like, yeah. oh yeah, this is an Oscar or anything. But it was solid entertainment, that's for sure, and good story, interesting, and that's fine. you know the the guy kind of. It's always it's kind of nice. I like it when uh, somebody is like, you know, especially if you've seen this guy always from The Office. You know, you kind of yeah, like always yeah. you already put him in a certain kind of scheme or or labeled him in a certain way, and it's nice to see how you can how an actor shows you that he's really an actor because he can entirely persuade you to see him as a completely different character and a different type of film and, and you don't even you don't see suddenly you didn't see Jim from the office anymore. You just you forgot about that part really yeah. quick. So that speaks for him and his oh, craft I get, and ability. I guess I'd agree with that. That's cool. Well and the fact that he he also directed the film, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure how to what extent he's involved in the writing. I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, the script was given to him. Uh, he he read the initial draft and okay. then he said he wanted to rewrite it and then uh, his wife at Emily Blunt is that her name? Yeah, uh, uh-huh. yeah. Then she ended up convincing him that he needs to direct it. This is his words. I watched the director's roundtable, and that's what he said. Um, and then she got on board. So it first came to him, but then he kind of rewrote it and did all the directing. Yeah, so, I'm yeah, sure so I, I give him, definitely give him credit for that for both the effort behind the camera and also the the acting and such. That was pretty. Yeah, definitely well done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, is there any uh, is there any movies I should see that I probably or maybe I have or haven't? That you really liked that you would You've recommend. You've seen Transporting. I I have, but it, it's kind of hard to remember. I saw it in college. I think I was a little yeah, drunk. Yeah. So otherwise, so I would say you know I recommend that. Um, but I might watch it again uh, after you hyped it up. Yeah. No. I and other pop fiction. I'm, I'm for sure right. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, I think the 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 other favorite films that I have, or they're really just films for very personal reasons, or. Uh, I would never go like, oh, that's something you have to see, or else you didn't really, you can't even. Yeah, that's it's hard to recommend movies for other people. Yeah, I'm like yeah. I loved it, but I wouldn't recommend. I don't yeah, know if I'd recommend yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just like you know, for the longest time, like I really like Cable Guy with John Kerry. Oh, yeah, you know, or even Dumb and Dumber, but 
I know some people really don't like Jim Carrey or could care yeah. less and do not want to see a film with Jim Carrey, you know. Yeah. So so I'm like, yeah. Um so um I can't think of the top of my head right now if there's any yeah. film where I'm like, oh, you gotta watch that. That's just um But I'll check out Transpotting because yeah. it's what's well, interesting right now there's a there's right? a actually there's a film um uh, I cannot think of the um in Eng- in, it's a French film. It came out a few years. Um my my best enemy or my best friend or something like this. Um, and but they made a as often they made a U.S. remake of that film, and now it's with um, Kevin Harris and um, Brian Cranston, where he's in a oh, wheelchair. Really? Oh, yeah. The writer is he the writer? Uh, he's the... in a he's in a wheelchair, and then the black guy is taking care of him. And oh, okay. so, in, 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 in the original French version, it's the same concept. You know, it's all about the. But I think th- this the the American remake, from what I can tell, didn't get the same kind of positive critical review. I think maybe they made it too more too more too much of a comedy film. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, but um, the the French original is really, it's both it's both funny, but it's also very thoughtful and and provokes emotions in a sense. Like it's a really well done film because it it kind of like you know shows you the absurdity of racial differences etc but that worked for that french film and also especially because it was about maybe what what's going on in france and so i'm not sure to what extent the filmmakers of the american version for instance attempted to have the same um have the same effect with that film from what i can tell they didn't they didn't get that um, you know oh, okay. I, I haven't read anybody who said oh this is a Everybody not, must see this film, but that was a film in France, and then also when it came out in Germany, where everybody went like, "You have to see this film. It's a really meaningful film, funny and meaningful." Mm. Yeah, I'll check it out. I definitely will. That and um, you transporting. You're talking about the Ewan McGregor movie, right? Transporting, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll watch that because I remember the end of that movie, but it's hard to remember like the middle of it. It was me and a bunch of friends hanging out, and I don't know how much I was paying attention, but yeah. And I don't know. Maybe you watched the maybe you <laughs> maybe it's one of those films where you you sit there and you <laughs> go, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, plus they talk they talk funny. It's a oh, Scottish, I remember. Yeah, yeah that they, always. It's a Scottish accent. I'll watch it yeah. with subtitles yeah, yeah. though. I I have to watch Sherlock with subtitles because I'm I'm terrible at hearing <laughs> accents. So, but it's just the absurdity of everything. It's just one of those films where like it takes place. It's kind of like similar to Boogie Nights. Oh, if you've seen Boogie, now there's a film you have to see. I haven't seen Boogie Nights. I should, I should have. You should have told me that. Like, I'm gonna, you're gonna ask me about my favorite films. I would have had that in my list. Right here, I could, I could have found. Boogie Nights is is definitely a film that you, everybody should watch. Boogie Nights. It's similar to to um uh what you know with um, Train Spotting is like where it's such a such an out of place setting because Boogie Nights takes place in the adult film world, oh, you know, okay. porn and that kind of stuff. But it could have taken. It's kind of like you know, it's it has the same comic not drama as in Game of Thrones or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and other things, you know what I mean? So or train spotting, same thing. It's about these losers that are shooting heroin and, you know, like why would you make a film about that? But it's fascinating and you root yeah. for them and, and, and train sp- uh, and, and Boogie Night, same thing. It's like you're it's this family of like minded people that suddenly f- they're all like outcasts, if you will, because they're all like in this, you know, seventies. It's kind of takes place seventies, eighties, in that seventies, eighties video f- porn film production. You know, so they are like they kind of like know that they're all outcasts in in a sense, and so in a way they're also all losers. <laughs> but but they're it's also then and they live in this bizarre world and and they go through changes and it's just as dramatic as as a as a Shakespeare play. You know, and so that's that's why I like it when a filmmaker can accomplish that, like mix a world that is so you know with drama or other things and bring the character so close to you but even though everything takes place in a world that is so far away from your own world or most of the audience's world you know what i mean we never you would never even think of that mm-hmm. that's cool i'll check it out yeah, Nights. Yeah. i've Boogie heard Nights a, is a, yeah heard a lot about it and, so. and that guy his name is anderson last name i think wes anderson no thomas anderson might be might I might not recalling the, the but it's the film uh, that, that's the film that put Mark Wahlberg back on really oh. brought him out that made him a star after that you know his after that the rest is history again like you know after that he was in high demand so but it was that film interesting and it has a bunch of other really good actors in there too that all owe a lot uh, because of that film Boogie Nights um, Boogie Nights yeah um, Burt Reynolds brought up Burt Reynolds similar to kind of like how when um, Pop Fiction was made 
how that reinvigorated the careers of John Travolta and suddenly everybody thought that Samuel L. Jackson was just the coolest guy, you know, similar mm-hmm. to that, like where everybody was just like, ooh, all of these, everybody who was in Pulp Fiction owes a lot to Quentin Tarantino for that he casted them for that film, even though it was just a small role, but because the film was so popular then and everybody suddenly, like I said, John Travolta is probably the best example, you know, I think mm-hmm. he was kind of like a forgotten person at that point. Everybody just associated him with Saturday Night Live and, and, and you know, the 70s, 80s flicks he did and that was about it and that brought him back. Oh, interesting. Yep. Yeah, I'll definitely check those out. Those sound fun. It's a, it's a good film. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. I love talking about movies. I don't have a lot of people in my life that I do that yeah, with. Yeah, I so. appreciate that because trust me, it doesn't happen too often <laughs> that, that people actually have a genuine interest in film. So, yeah. yeah I like, thought I was going to wear you out because you have to do this every day. But. No, but we, I don't talk uh, the, the, the depth of what we talk. And, it, you know, it's always a difference when you talk with somebody who is like minded or mm-hmm. has the same kind of um, insight to films that you do. And, and, you know, you don't have to explain a whole lot. Yeah. Um, then it's fun to, whereas with the students, you almost have to begin f- from A, you know, you have to really kind of like, okay, no, I, that doesn't mean anything to you. Well, let me explain that. And, you know, like whatever it is we even talked about today, like a lot of them, for a lot of the students that I have, they would have been like been lost already because they don't, they didn't okay. follow or they, you know, wasn't their time or Vietnam War. What is that again? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. There, there's this, there's this, this continuity of, of context of, of like this kind of, um, historical oversight of things of how things evolved or happened over time and changed Mm -hmm. um well it's a lot to expect from anyone from who's in high school not that i'm blaming them or i'm you know yeah yeah um, so um just on that's that's rare that you have that in high school student who's already like you know has is such a cineast that they already know what they already know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. yeah well that's kind of my intention with this is just to find more people that i can talk in depth with movies about right. <laughs> so i really appreciate it yeah. thanks for thanks absolutely. for having me here it's fun being Ab- back absolutely yeah all right have a yeah. good one